Welcome everybody. I am now going to start one of my talks relating to imaging of the brain stem tracks. Now, uh, if you look at this case, most people will not have any trouble identifying a stroke involving the left side of the pons and the dictation uh, will just stay left side pontine stroke, end of story. But the very important thing about this case is that it involves the left cortical spinal tract, and that's almost never mentioned in the report. The reason being that the brainstem, because of its complexity, has been a region that most uh, doctors, if they can, would avoid uh, if possible. But now, because of what we can see with modern neuroradiology, including DTI, tractography, I think that we should become a little more familiar with the anatomy because uh, we can see so much more nowadays. Now, if you look at this anatomic diagram with all these numbers, you can see why people would be turned off from studying it because of the difficulty in following what's happening here. That's the same in this very informative diagram, which would be very difficult to try to focus on. So I just, and the same thing here with this diagram with multiple structures in it. I decided to, to approach the brainstem in a different way by isolating all the various tracks and, tracks and structures that we should know about, either by seeing them or knowing where they are, and describing each one separately, hopefully making that more manageable. I'm going to start with the cortical spinal tract and the cortical bulbar, or also cortical pontine, known as the cortical pontine tract. The pyramidal system initiates movement, and the extrapyramidal system and cerebellum uh, adjust continual posture. Now, the cortical representation of the motor areas is a topic for a whole different talk, and I'm just showing the two slides here to identify them, but I will not be talking about the cortical representation. Now this uh, diagram uh, from Stark and Bradley shows that the cortical spinal tract and the cortical bulbar tracts as they start in the region of the homunculus and the cerebral cortex, go through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, through the brainstem, peduncle region, through the pons, medulla, and then crossing over uh, to the opposite side of the spinal cord. We can also see the cortical bulbar tract, which ends at, uh, at each level where the uh, cranial nerve nucleus sits. And there, these cortical bulbar fibers and the nuclei I will be covering during my talk on the talks on the cranial nerves. So now let's discuss and describe each of these areas separately. Interestingly enough, just before we leave the cortical bulbar tract, there's a paper just this month in AJNR showing tractography of the fibers going from the face and the tongue region to the appropriate area in the pons. So again, showing that we should be familiar with was the position of the all the cortical spinal tract and the cortical pontine tracts. Now, when we have the sequelae of a stroke with valerian degeneration, we can follow the course of the cortical spinal tract and the various components of the brain much more easily than on the intact person. And that's because of the findings of valerian degeneration. Now, what is valerian degeneration? 
A sec secondary anti-grade degeneration of axon and their myelin sheath caused by proximal axonal or neuronal cell body lesion. It may begin within one week of damage and continue for six months or much longer. While they're in degeneration, the CNS signifies irreversible loss of neuronal function. It's somewhat difficult to diagnose in neonates and infant. However, DWI allows early detection even in neonates and infants. Uh, some people like to divide it into various stages. The first stage is the first four weeks. Stage two is four to 14 weeks. Stage three is when there's myelin, lipid breakdown, and gliosis. And stage four is complete atrophic changes in the ipsilateral brainstem. So back to this case of stroke, we'll start with a corticospinal tract within the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So here's a diagrammatic representation of the internal capsule. We can see that the, at the genu of the internal capsule are the face, uh, the face fibers. Further in the posterior limb, we have the, the arm, the trunk, and the leg. In this diagram, they're somewhat anterior in the posterior limb. But as you will see, it turns out on MR and in diffusion, we see that the fibers are kind of centered a little in the posterior part of the internal capsule, not more anteriorly. It may be that the extremity fibers are much more lo larger and more pronounced, and that's why we only see those. But nevertheless, on MR, we can identify the fibers of the corticospinal in the posterior part of the posterior limb. Interestingly, in this diagram from Carpenter's book, we can see that he positions the corticospinal tract fiber in the posterior part of the posterior limb, while the corticobulbar fibers are more anteriorly. So again, more, more like this diagram from Carpenter. Now interestingly, in, in this a diagram from this requisites, we can see it must have been work done on monkeys, but you could see the precise location that they mapped out of all the various muscles. So that information, I guess, is available, although it's below the resolution that we so far have on MR. Okay, so here we have a patient with lo left lower extremity weakness, and we see restricted diffusion on the DWI, the ADC, and also abnormal signals. So a stroke in the posterior part of the posterior limb. Here's an MS case with a lesion in the posterior part of the posterior limb, likely involving the corticospinal tract. And now let's move on beyond the internal capsule to the peduncle, where we see abnormal center in this center of the peduncle. Now, in the peduncle, the corticospinal tracts are arranged uh, just by location. They're very organized. The face, the arm, the trunk, and the leg fibers are in this position. I reversed the slide because this is the way we look at an imaging, not the way the anatomist and the, the neurologist and other specialty demonstrated in their publications. So if we now look, this is the region of the corticospinal tract, and look at, look at this patient who had a stroke. You can see the abnormality in the center of the peduncle, which is also much smaller when compared to the opposite side. So again, other patients with stroke, all involving the corticospinal tract in the central portion of the peduncle. And here's a specimen uh, showing the difference between the normal peduncle uh, 
where the staining and the, a the, the atrophy in the center of this reduced uh, pedunculus size. Okay, and here's a case of an acute stroke in the peduncle, and 18 months later in the follow-up, we can see the abnormal signal in the center of the peduncle. And you can see it right here. So that tells you that the corticospinal tract are involved here. Let's move to the pons. In the pons, we may see a single cluster of where the corticospinal tract runs, as we can see here, or the fibers may also be separate, I'll show later. The reason the corticospinal tract fibers may be separated because there's a huge number of fibers crossing from side to side. Those fibers belong to the cortico uh, cerebellar pontine tract that separates the various parts of the corticospinal tract into individual fascicles. Diagram as described here in this diagram and also seen on the histologic side. So that's why, or let's say on a flare image, instead of seeing a single structure where the corticospinal tract should be, we see these multiple separate fiber tracks of the corticospinal tract. And again, we on DTI can see the corticospinal tract, but be, instead of being separated like it is in life, the limitation of DTI bunched them all together. So this blue area, that's the corticospinal tract. It's blue because of the superior inferior or inferior superior direction. The other tracks are the anterior posterior are in green, the right to left, left to right are in, in red, and but the up and down are in blue. The rest of these tracks that I'm showing here, I will that are seen here, I will discuss in later talks. But right now we're focusing the anterior group of blue. Those are the two corticospinal tract in the pons. Now we can also identify the corticospinal tract on a sagittal T2 image. Here it is, similar to what's seen in the histologic slide. Here it is on an anatomic s specimen and has also been shown here on tractography uh, from the literature. Here again is uh, tractography showing the corticospinal tract and a kind of a bluish tinge because of superior inferior direction on this DTI image, tractography image. So now, when we see a stroke involving the anterior part of the pons, we can say with certainty that this involves the corticospinal tract, as we can see by the position on tractography, DTI image, and on the specimens. And also. Now, one of the interesting things about pontine strokes is that the circulation of the pons is divided into the various territories. The perforating branches has its own territory, then the circumferential branches, the long and the short. Each territory has its own distribution. So here we can see that this stroke likely involves the perforating branches coming off the basilar artery. Here's another showing this kind of rectangular uh, territorial distribution of the stroke, again, would involve at least anteriorly the corticospinal tract. So again, strokes of the corticospinal tract, and I just want to show the specimen uh, that was histologically stained. Notice the normal corticospinal tract and the gliosis on this side having no no corticospinal tract at all. Of course, these are separate uh, imaging. This imaging was not of the same case that I'm showing. 
Okay, so now let's proceed uh, below. So here again is the peduncle, and here just to show, as I said before, we don't see a single cluster of gliosis in the ponds, but the individual attracts because of the separation by the crossing pontine fibers. So now we're moving on to the medulla. Here's an abnormal medulla on the, on the left side. This is the py normal pyramid. Notice the pyramid on the left side is quite small. What runs through the pyramid? The corticospinal tracts. So again, we see a stroke. So this is valerian degeneration and atrophy of the corticospinal tract at the level of the medulla. Again, this is on the opposite side. Normal pyramid, normal olive on the, this side, flattening and absence of the normal cortical spinal tract because of a stroke. And again, a little bit of abnormal signal, a slightly different level. And notice again on this specimen from the literature, the stained specimen, normal pyramid on the left side, gliotic and absent cortical spinal tract on the right side, just in front of the olive, just like we see on the MR, the normal olive bump, the normal cortical spinal tract pyramid, absent pyramid here, just like on the specimen. Again, just like on the, on the peduncle, the medulla has also precise organization of the fibers, the, the sacral, the lumbar, the thoracic, and the cervical. But again, the detail on MR is still not good enough to separate these various uh, fiber clusters. Again, in the medulla, there's very precise distribution of the territorial vascular supply. In the center will be perforating branches coming off the vertebral artery. More laterally will be the anterior inferior cerebellar artery and much more laterally the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So for instance here we have a stroke involving the territory of the pica because it's lateral. Here we have a stroke involving the medial part of the medulla by the perforators coming off the vertebral arteries. And uh, again, a different patient sawing again, the medial part is involved because of the perforating branches. By the way, I want to give credit to Gino and Daniel who found these images for me uh, after I mentioned that I needed them and within a few days they sent me to this. So again, I want to thank them publicly or on this talk. So again, now we can see that even normally we can follow the cortical spinal plane from the subcortical or cortical area down to the posterior limb, posterior limb. Also we can see in, in the corona radiata here, down to the peduncle, the pons, and the medulla. Same thing on a normal flare. We can follow the cortical spinal tract because of slightly higher signal, possibly because maybe the large number of large fibers in there, motor fibers, Again, cortical region or subcortical, centrum semiovalli, corona radiata, posterior limb of the internal capsule, peduncle, and pons. Now, of course, we already know that uh, DTI shows very nicely the various fiber tracks, and here we see the 
cortical spinal tract, the bulbar tracts in the centrum seminal valley, corona radiata in the peduncle region and also in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. We can also identify normally the corticospinal tract on normal flare imaging, as you can see here, very similar to what we see in this diagram, the coronal view of the corticospinal tract. And of course, on a coronal image of a stroke patient, the valerian generation involved in corticospinal tract. And here's a case I found showing uh, tra the DTI images of the cortical spinal tract, again in blue, because of the cranial caudal or caudal cranial direction. Now, not only can we see the valerian degeneration at the same side where the stroke occurred. But as we follow it down to the pons, medulla, medulla, here it is crossing, and here it is on the opposite side of the cervical spinal cord. It took me some time to find this case, but shows beautifully the crossing. So this is the whole process of the crossing fibers. Now, this diagram from Carpenter shows nicely what's happening. Here's the corticospinal tract. 90% of the fibers will cross at the level of the foramen magnum and end on the opposite side of the spinal cord where they will go down and then enter, the fibers will enter the central gray. 8% of the fibers will not cross at the level of the foramen magnum, they'll travel on the same side all the way down to where they're given off, and then the fibers will cross over to supply the gray. 2% of fibers never cross. They stay on the same, so the uncrossed lateral cortical spinal tract in the spine. The cross fibers are called the lateral cortical spinal tract and the ones that travel anteriorly and eventually cross are the anterior cortical spinal tract, but the major ones are on the lateral cortical spinal tract. And here we can see the diagram. This is the pyramid. This is the region and at the foramen magnum where the fibers are crossing, and then they end up in the lateral cortical spinal tract, which is di diagrammed over here. So how do we find where the foramen magnum region is? It's actually, if you look at, this is the shape of the medulla, you know, with the pyramid, the olive, still a little bit pyramid here. Then you get to this round structure, that's right at the level of the foramen magnum, where I, this is right this level here. And you see, once you get into the cervical cord, it has a more elliptical shape. So this round shape helps you determine. So this is right right here. You can see the shape of the medulla on the specimen, the rounded shape, and then the elliptical shape of the upper cervical cord with the lateral cortical spinal tract here. It's again on very thin slices you again can see the shape of the medulla. This would be the level of the foramen magnum and then you're moving on to the cord. And here we see left-sided stroke, cortical spinal tract. Here it is in the pons, left side medulla, crossing at the foramen magnum, and then also a little bit on the other side. This patient had a dissection, multiple regions of stroke. Six months later, Valerian degeneration of the cortical spinal tract. Notice a little bit of abnormal signal here. But more beautifully, we can see again cortical spinal tract, valerian degeneration. Here it is medulla, medulla.
Here it is, crossed over to the other side of the cervical cord. And we can actually see the crossing here. Uh, and here it is on the opposite side. Just again, there you have the crossing and the opposite side in the lateral cortical spinal tract in the cervical cord. Again, showing it all together, we can follow it all the way to the spinal cord. Right side here, left side here. And here's a case of Toxo. Again, valerian degeneration going through. You see it all the way, posterior limb, posterior limb, peduncle, pons, medulla, and here it is on the opposite side of the cervical cord. So if you get a patient with a history of right-sided weakness, let's say five days prior to the study, so, and it has left-sided abnormalities in the pons in the region of the corticospinal tract, you can say that the lesion relates to the symptoms. So you can have some sophisticated discussion with a clinician. Here's a patient presents with left leg weakness and a stroke involving the right corticospinal tract and in, in the pons. So again, we know that this lesion relates to the symptoms because he had left leg weakness. Here's a patient with right leg weakness, patient has MS. The lesion is on the right side of the medulla, so this lesion is unlikely to relate to the patient's weakness because his weakness is in the left leg, so it should have been uh, should have been on the opposite side. Now, many times people will describe the cortical changes of a post-biopsy. This was for a lung med. But I almost never seen the report discussion or description there's also involvement, valerian degeneration of the cortical spinal tract uh, relating to this changes of the MET biopsy. And this is, here it is on the coronal plane, again, the involvement of the cortical spinal tract. This patient had a massive infection of the thalamus and the patient had a biopsy to determine the organism and unfortunately developed a massive hematoma. Six months later, valerian degeneration involving the pons and medulla. And not only that, but we can also see the crossing of the valerian degeneration and the involving of the opposite side of the, this is the lateral corticospinal tract. So again, the crossing over the fibers. Another biopsy, GBM biopsy. Again, no description you know, I'm focusing on these images so you can look at it and see it clearly, but when you look at the whole case, uh, there was no description of the valerian degeneration involving the various co components of the corticospinal tract. Another patient, lung met, post-gamma knife and laser thermocoagulation, secondary valerian degeneration of the cortical spine tract with all its components. Renal carcinoma met with valerian degeneration. Again, very obvious in the appropriate locations. Post-anaplastic astro, valerian degeneration. Post-oligo again, valerian degeneration. Again, all fitting and in this location that we see in the brain stem. This is, you know, what we'd not try to do in preoperative uh, DTI imaging, 
to identify the position of the corticospinal tract prior to surgery so the surgeon can avoid damaging it. Here's a patient from the literature with pilocytic astrocytoma deforming and pushing the corticospinal tract medially. A ganglioglioma displacing the corticospinal tract and kind of thinning the fibers here. A large anaplastic PXA pushing the corticospinal tract markedly medially when compared to the opposite side. This is a case that Frank Minger gave me over a high grade glioma, and we can see the corticospinal tract being displaced medially. Uh, and again, I would like if somebody would send me some images of the cases they have done uh, to add to my collection. This was a very interesting case from the literature. The patient had a GBM and the surgeon was going to resect it, but he was a little concerned that the tractography showed that the, there was paucity of the fibers here compared to the other side of the corticospinal tract. And even here, here's a normal corticospinal tract blue. It's kind of lacking here. So he did not resect it, and then a few months later, it involved the, the region of the corticospinal tract. So this was an early evidence that the corticospinal tract will be involved or was already involved. Now these are very interesting images of children with uh, gliomas or involved in the brainstem, mainly the pons. So here's a normal, for instance, showing the corticospinal tract and the other tracts, and here it's all totally disrupted because of the infiltrative, you know, the the low, the mark infiltration and destruction of the, or displacement and destruction of the fibers, and we no longer have the normal anatomy in the pons and these kids involved with pontine gliomas. This was a very interesting case uh, this is a, a three-year-old had mild left-sided muscular hy hypertonia since birth. And when oh, did the imaging, the, the peduncle was a little smaller in this side. But the interesting thing was then when they did the DTI, there was no corticospinal tract in a normal position. There was the other side, but it was not there where it should be. But the interesting thing that when they did the tractography, they found it, but it was displaced at the level of the pons posteriorly, as we can see here, basically into the medial lemniscus that I'll talk about next time. So this was tremendously useful in identifying that there was there, but it was just congenitally in the wrong position. It was displaced posteriorly. And here are some cases from the literature showing disruption of the cortical spinal tract. This is a fibrillary astrocytoma in the pons and medulla, normal cortical spinal tract in the coronal plane, disrupted cortical spinal tract, as you can see here. Carinoma and the medulla disrupted corticospinal tract compared to a normal in the sagittal plane. This is a very interesting case of a pilocytic. You can see the lesion here. You look at the images, even the DTI upper, you see it looks okay here. But even we don't see much on the T2. Notice the mark abnormality here. Here's a normal cortical spinal tract on this side, but on the right side, it's very atrophic. Really a beautiful example. So there was valerian degeneration, which was not obvious on the regular imaging, but the DTI demonstrated beautifully by the markedly diminished size 
of this corticospinal tract on the right side. Here's a hematoma in the left hemisphere displacing the corticospinal tract, as we can see here, compared to the opposite side. And then when the hematoma resolved, the corticospinal tract went back to more normal position, as we can see here. So here it is displaced. Here it is back to normal. Okay, what is this abnormality? You would think, oh, this is normal, just kind of prominent corticospinal tract, but looks pretty abnormal here on the region lower down in the, in the region of the peduncle. This is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It's progressive fatal neurodegenerative disease showing selective degeneration of lower and upper motor neurons. Primarily involves the anterior horn cells. Cranial nerves may also be involved. More severe in the precentral than postcentral gyri. Eventual loss of the cortical spinal tract. Uh, there's the diagnosis is usually made by the hyperintensity on DWI T2 flare and proton density images, as we can see here. Uh, again, notice the loss of signal in the motor region in, in front of the central sulcus, and again, the high signal uh, in the corticospinal tract. We see it here in the peduncle and also in the subcortical area here. And this somebody did nicely a normal cortical spinal tract in green. And here it is with the patient was ALS showing marked reduction in the, in the number of fibers. This is a case we had that was initially read as normal because as I pointed out, you normally will see uh, the cortical spinal tract, but this was actually a case who was related to somebody working in the department who was carrying a diagnosis of ALS now for many years. So this was an abnormal study, although not as pronounced as some other cases in the literature. Now, the other condition that can cause hyperintense appearance of various levels of the cortical spinal tap, heroin inhalation, X-linked -link, adrenal leukodystrophy, Wilson's disease, hypoglycemic coma, and hepatic encephalopathy, which is more commonly what we will see. It can all be, s be seen in MS, ADM, and AIDS. Some neoplasm may cause that, and a hereditary spastic paraplegia. Here's a case we had of hepatic encephalopathy, and we can see the cortical spinal tract you know, in the centrum semio valley, in the corona radiata, and also lower down in the peduncles. And there was, like, as I said, hepatic encephalopathy. There was also the case had uh, spectroscopy that showed the glutamine peak, uh, which is due, due to the increased ammonia within the blood and the astrocytes. Now, it's been described that there's normalization of the T2 signal abnormalities in the hemisphere after liver transplant. But uh, the few cases that we had did not really show it after a transplant, but uh, it's supposed to disappear. Here's some other conditions that show abnormalities of the cortical spinal tract. This is a newborn showing cortical spinal tract involving in the cortex area, corona radiata, posterior limb internal capsule, peduncles, pons and medulla on the DWI and on the ADC. And this is maple syrup disease autosomal recessive metabolic ketoacidoria. Unfortunately, these kids 
don't do well because of this ketoacidoria. And the last condition I want to show, which in this case spares the corticospinal tract, and that is osmotic demyelinating syndrome, also known as cent central pontine myelonysis. For some reason, it spares the, the corticospinal tract, it has this kind of double eagle's uh, appearance, and notice there's no abnormal signal uh, in the region of the corticospinal tract. And here's another case showing, but sparing the region of the corticospinal tract. And this is the last image I'll be showing today. And next time we will study the other tracks of the brainstem.